The following episode of the Comics and Crypto Podcast is for informational purposes only, and anything expressed by the hosts or their guests is solely their opinion. This podcast does not constitute financial advice, and anyone wishing to invest should seek their own independent financial or professional help. Have fun, and enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Sean O'Hare, and I know comics. Hi, I'm Spencer Vogel, and I know crypto. Hi, I'm Kevin Lee Loader, and I don't know shit. This is the Comics and Crypto Podcast. Comics and Crypto Last month, the 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle rookie card, which is a grade 9.5, sold for $12.6 million, which set an all-time record for a sports card. I think all cards in general. Do you believe these types of record sales help the overall collectibles market? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that card was an interesting one because I think it was part of uh, the Rosen find, Mr. Mint. Yeah. It was the one that he said was the finest that he'd ever seen. And uh, I think PSA had an opportunity. It would have been great for them to grade it a 10, but maybe they just didn't see it as a 10. Uh, but it would have been, it would have been shocking and enormous. Uh, this wouldn't have been a $12.6 million sale. It would have been a $35 million sale. Um, but that just goes to show you, look, there must have been a lot of integrity there because it would be tempting, right? Yeah be very tempting. So maybe we learned a lot about it not being the fourth one, about the integrity of our grading. And maybe we learned a lot about the integrity of it being a nine five in general, because, you know, you, a, a 10 on a vintage item like that, that's 67 years old, doesn't need to necessarily hit the exact same standards as something that's fresh off the line two seconds ago. I mean, close, really close, but maybe not exactly. It's maybe not at the microscopic level, you know, mm -hmm. because it was a different, it, it's a, it's a different type of manufacturing, different cardstock, different, a lot of things. So I was, I, I was disappointed that this wasn't a 10, but I was also kind of pleased because what it meant was there was a lot of integrity in the system. Um, 12.6 million on the nine five was a great indicator of not just it being a 9.5, but the card itself was very special in terms of the roadmap it had. And, but I will tell you, regardless as to whether the PSA 10s are, if you so, line them up side by side and take a microscope or, and, and take the Hubble telescope to it and find, you know, differences that make the 10 better or not, all three of those cards are 30 plus million dollar cards. They are they're, it, they're symbolic as much as they are anything else. They're symbols of something huge. Um, the Honus Wagner 8 that was cut is a $30 million card. It was cut. Uh, but it's also graded what it's graded. And it's, you know, in many ways earns it. It's an incredible card. There are a few out there like that. Last February, Top sold a one of one NFT of the 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle rookie card. That sold for $471,000. Do you think that this kind of sale, this record sale helps the counterpart? I think it all depends on what they do next. If they create a one of one of that in 13,000 different ways uh, over the next 10 years, then I'm, I, I don't really necessarily think uh, you know, a one of one is great, but if there's 13,000 separate one of ones in various ways, shapes, and forms, is there really one or is there 13,000? Um, digital is a little tougher to trust um, in that regard versus physical. Digital is also very trustworthy in terms of establishing authenticity. So you get a little, you know, you, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 when you do say this is the first one of one of this of this it does definitively strike it's like planting a flag on the moon i mean you are you you're you're there first so there is viability there um it just it really depends on what they do next
if if they don't go over the top and do the 13,000 different one of ones then yeah it could it could escalate in value over time but if they do the other then you know that 451,000 may not be very pleasing to the person that bought it later on yeah we, we kind of referenced this the same as like on vivi as well right like the a15 just dropped recently it was only yeah. 10,000 editions so combine yeah. that with the physicals it was less less than 14,000 probably 15,000 exists yes. which is yep. amazing which is amazing amazing it's different than a one of one that that represents a historical uh singular item but it's but it's extremely interesting i mean i i do believe in low you know again these things are only as valuable as the long term program itself so i think that once you drop it and once you've celebrated it you have to just embrace the fact that that moment is gone and now it's time to find the next thing to celebrate and embrace because once you start going back to the well over and over again it does signal um that the collectability of that particular item is less scarcity is less of a thing so yeah. it's this is not an easy uh this is not an easy business the concept of secondary market value attached to collectability remember with physical goods most physical goods that are out there are the utility is to display and show off your fandom it's not necessarily because you're expecting everything you have mint on cards going to go up a thousand percent so I, I think that we have to take the same approach to digital not everything that's going to be manufactured is going to be something that's going to you know have a rocket ship to the moon um but some could but again, it depends on on their ability to manage the longevity of the platform. Yeah, I think it's really about like creating the collector experience and making people want to stay involved and doing things that make people want to want to hold on to it. You know, absolutely, absolutely. Do uh, mint numbers matter to you for like comic books specifically on VV? I think it's cool. Yeah, I I, I I think that it's one of the way I I do think that the numer the, the numerology that the way things are numbered numerology is probably not the word but the way the numbering <laughs> systems numerology sounds like uh, the the numbering systems of a collectible have always mattered i mean i can go all the way back to you know being one of the first drops ever that's a collector exclusive that we did at, at comic con in 2000 it was a he-man uh um I believe it was a, I think it was a Keldor or something like that. And it was one of a thousand and each, um, each box was numbered sequentially. And I saw the power of numbering systems right there. I mean, you know, so there's a lot of ways to add value, you know, grading is a way to add value in physical products. Um, numbering is a way to add value, especially if you have like the first, um, but if you have like the hundredth of the thousandth, there's a little bit, of, there's a premium value there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do, I like the concept of there being a um, numbering, ma ma you know, making a difference in terms of those collectibles. But I would also, it would also be interesting, you know, the difference between physical and digital collectibles is physical, digital collectibles can also open a broader world. So they could also later on establish if you have a one, the first hundred or the first 500 of whatever, that look at this thing that's unlocked for you. Um, but that that's down the path. So the well, you've already utility, started to see that a little bit, like the, the master collector program. Like if you have, I think yeah. it's within the top 5% mint numbers, then you have an extra little boost with the, the collector points that you earn. Yes, the collector points. Uh, and, and there could be other utility too. It could be, you know, having in uh, the top 5%, you know, whatever, if there's 10,000 and you've got one of the first hundred, it could open other doors that are digital in nature. It could open other doors that are experiential in nature. So part of the value could be to come. And part of the value is just in the, the fact that as humans, we love to use numerical indicators as a part of our collectible experience. We're super bullish on like the uh, the publishing year of, of a collectible. 
Um, yeah, and having exactly. the, the number associated with that. Yeah, we, we just made a, a very big purchase of the uh, the 1976 Luke Skywalker uh, lightsaber. 77. 77, my bad. 77. <laughs> nice. Yeah, no, yeah. 76 would have been especially interesting because it would have, yeah. you would have like come in before the movie. That would have been, yeah. yeah. That would have been <laughs> awesome. But, but um, no, I, I, I like, I like, see, see what you're doing right now is you guys are pioneers, right? There's a lot of pioneers right now on, you know, VV um, and the, establishing what the rules of collectability are. Um, a lot of it's happening with the community. A lot of it's happening with the, the folks that are communicating about the items themselves. And, um, and that's very interesting. The, the mint year attached to the numerical system um, is a viable way to establish value or premium value versus something else. But again, I mean, one critical, critical thing is the long-term, the long-term plan and really the promise that implied or expressed promise that once something is dropped, that it will not be dropped again in quite that way, at least. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I do think that these earlier drops matter. Um, and I do, and I, I will say that a lot of the licensing partners that VV has been with or gone with have been pretty consistent and, and focused in terms of their distribution. Um, yeah, but you know, that, that could play, that, that can play a role long-term in valuation. Is there any specific major IP that has not been introduced to the blockchain yet that you're most excited to see turn into digital collectibles? <laughs> that is such a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> that is so loaded. Um, I think that there's, <laughs> I think there's IP that there's intellectual property holders that, uh, that lay back and let things play out. And then, at some point in time, they reinvent and blow people's minds. Um, I will say, and the analogy is pretty direct and straightforward, Pokemon Go. They didn't rush to get into app-based games. They found a technology that was spectacular and they invested in it. And then they leveraged it to bring an experience. Um, and, you know, a lot of the things that are happening right now in digital collectibles and NFTs, it's very primitive. You know, it is. It's, it's a static image or something that does a little bit of stuff, but it doesn't give you a very immersive experience yet. Mm -hmm. um, so there are those types of IP holders that are out there. And by the way, primitive doesn't mean bad. Primitive could also mean like this, you know, primitive in... Uh, so many other areas of collectability is fantastic because it was that era when things were simple and, you know, easy to understand. And then it ended and you have this, you know, you have this specific time that has real value. So maybe that's part of it, but you have a lot of IP holders out there that are waiting to provide some miraculous experience and, Maybe some of my favorite brands could be in that in that category, but you never know. I mean, like I, I couldn't tell you one way or the other uh, what a brand that I don't manage at the very very you know top of the food chain will do. Um, creating the global toys for something doesn't make you necessarily the owner of the property. Um, now. Um, I do think that over time you're going to see some pretty miraculous stuff out there, and uh, and I don't know, I don't know whether it'll be ex fully experiential, but one thing I've always said about the digital experience is that right now, it's a one or two senses being used, and mostly sight or visual, but much like video games where each console provided a bigger, richer experience, at some point in time you will have a five cents experience. Um, and that's when physical and digital start to feel very similar anyway. 
Mm-hmm. So um, a lot, a lot can, a lot can change in the next generation that, you know, knock on wood, we're hopefully around for you guys will be for sure. Mm-hmm. But the more I actually start looking like Yoda, the less I might. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's especially exciting seeing the technology start to come out. You know, I know there's been a lot of speculation around Apple as well, releasing those AR glasses next year. And absolutely. Um, and mm-hmm. the creators of Pokemon Go, they're creating a new Marvel game, which looks amazing. They announced a D23. And, and then mm-hmm. did you see on, on uh, Disney Plus, they're remembering the short film with the, the, the unbelievable. It's yeah. Really impressive. No. Oh. I mean, it's just an, another indicator of what's to come and, and how technology can influence um, not just uh, our senses, but the way we collect things. And now a word from our sponsor. Looking to buy or sell physical comics? Then check out Elite Comics 11, Instagram's number one community-powered comic sales page. Elite Comics 11 is our favorite place to safely buy and sell comics. They are a CGC and CBCS authorized dealer and sell a variety of comics from Silver Age Grails to modern day keys. Inventory is updated daily and don't forget to check out their incredible almost daily live stream comic sales. The next time you're looking to buy or sell physical comics, make sure you turn to Elite Comics 11. Follow at Elite underscore Comics 11 on Instagram and see what all the buzz is about. How do you think licensors can use NFTs to future-proof their IPs? I mean, you know, it's interesting. The concept of future-proof is, uh, it's tough. You know, I'll I'll give you an example. Um, Jeffrey Bezos was asked at one point, um, you know, how do you feel about being the, you know, essentially, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but the, the killer of independent bookstores. And he said, I'm the killer of independent bookstores. He goes, actually, uh, Amazon didn't kill independent bookstores. He said, the future killed independent bookstores. He said, in one day, the future will kill Amazon. So if you've got Jeff Bezos, and then he added, and hopefully I'm not around to see that. (laughs) But if you've got Jeff Bezos, who's got, you know, maybe the second highest amassed wealth in, in the world, and with an enormous business that is, you know, growing at a pace that's outrageous and amazing, really, you can look and you can see that they've gone from a billion dollars in annual sales to something like 400 billion in just a couple decades. Um, Whereas other retailers have certainly not seen that kind of growth. Um, I think the idea of future proofing is not necessarily all that realistic. Um, but I will say that there are brands that seem to have extreme longevity and, um, and seem to be very reactive to major technology and seem to really constantly evolve. And, you know, I, I keep relating back to Pokemon because I deal with them all the time. I mean, they're such a critical brand in my life in terms of our business and our partnerships. I'll give you an example. Star Wars has been around since 1977, as we've communicated just in this, in this call. So that's 45 years, 70, yeah, 77. And in 45 years, they've done something like $70 billion at retail. Okay. And up until, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, those numbers were so mind boggling that you might think, well, no, nobody could ever catch Star Wars. Like that's, that's the uncatchable brand, right? Well, Pokemon's been around since 1996 globally and 99 in the US. And in 25 years, 26 years, Pokemon's done over $125 billion. Uh, So the uncatchable brand has averaged about $1.3, $1.2, $1.3 billion a year. Well, Pokemon's done an average of like five. And so I don't know what future proofing looks like in that, in that scenario. So my answer to you is um, be very flexible, have a long, long term plan, have a great platform that you protect the brand at all costs all the time, 
respect your fandom, um, provide experiences that are remarkable, um, that keep them engaged, have a multifaceted platform of experiential platform. Like Pokemon has the game and they have the video game. They have the TV show. They have so many ways you can engage and be of the Jeff Bezos mindset because the moment you let your guard down, you know, you are subject to this future proofing concern that you've, that you've communicated. So you gotta, you gotta keep driving and it is a forever process. So I guess in general, what, what excites you the most about digital collectibles? In general, the, the thing that excites me the most about digital collectibles is that they're scalable, you know, physical collectibles are what they are and they can do exactly what they purport to do. They sit there and look at you as you look back at them, but they, they can't act as the key to something else. Digital collectibles can act as a key. They can be scalable. Um, you can always build on them. And that's an interesting, interesting concept. That's what makes me the most excited from a collectability standpoint. But I think the most valuable concept of blockchain is just the ability to track and to that, that history matters. Um, especially, you know, I'm sure you've always heard the stories of people in the 1950s, you know, people of color specifically in the 1950s creating an asset. And then all of a sudden the royalties are vanished forever and never, you can never get them again. Well, today, you know, if you dropped, uh, a music asset on blockchain and had a smart contract that identified who the original rights holder was, it's, it could be a in perpetuity payment whenever these things are transferred. Um, so I guess, I guess what I'm saying is it just, the value in a digital world is not just in the utility of scalability, but also in the concept that, you know, you are in a much, you're in a playing field where the universe is, it, it's turned on its head. Everything that you've always sort of understood, every bias that's ever existed, every way that a human can figure out a way to separate is turned on its head. And that's, that's greatly interesting because really the thing that is most valuable to humanity is our, is our earnest approach to other people um, and our intellectual prowess. You know, what's going on in between your ears is way, way more important than anything else in terms of the value you can add. And so I, I liked the ideal of digital to um, allow more of that. Very, very important to, to preserve what's what's going on between people's ears and uh, and make sure that they're rewarded for it, you know, on an ongoing Absolutely. basis. Absolutely. Regardless of anything, regardless of ability, regardless of gender, regardless of culture, religion, race, philosophy, and politics. Yeah. And it's a great thing. Technology doesn't discriminate. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's always been exciting to me. Um, I love the scalability. I love the humanitarian potential, but also don't, you know, keep another thing in mind too. With all of this said, you know, AI is a very scary endeavor, not to spook anybody here out. The concept of, uh, of intelligence is a construct that humans have developed, but who's to say that intelligence can't be a construct that exists outside of humans and what happens when that occurs. So as these experiential things that are digital become more and more all encompassing, the experiences themselves start to figure themselves out. So I, I'm personally hopeful that we can, uh, that this doesn't become like the Simpsons episode where the, I think it's bees or something take over. And they're like, I, for one, hail our new bee leaders. I, I don't remember what that was, but if that should ever occur, I'll be the first one being like, peace out guys. I'm, I'm, I'm going with our new uh, digital uh, 
later. See, see ya. Uh, I know <laughs> a lot about AI. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I, yeah. I'll go with Elon to uh, Pluto or something. <laughs> Anyways, not to go too far off topic here. Uh, <laughs> it's all great. Love to hear the perspective. It's great. <laughs> So I guess, are, are there any IPs that have released uh, collectibles recently in the digital space that you've been really impressed with or really excited about? You know, I, I, I have been impressed by, you know, I like, I have to say, you know, Funko has done a really nice job. Mm-hmm. Um, I am impressed. They're doing a lot of digital, physical. Yeah, um, we're both big collectors on the Funkos yeah, that they've been I, doing digitally, yeah. You know, they have a wonderful platform with Pops and mm-hmm. what they're doing there is impressive. I have not been impressed with what's going on with the one of 10,000 or one of multi thousand uh, platforms. And I think that, you know, one of the best things I've seen in OpenSea is they added activity, showing the, uh, the amount of activity in any particular uh, collectible. Um, and they're also showing the best bid versus the floor. Yeah. Um, I think those two things are pretty enlightening. Um, and I would say, you know, I, I'll just say the one thing I've been saying from day one, regardless of how hot VV was or whatever sort of promise any of these other uh, platforms looked, diversify your base, diversify. G- you know, if you're a collector, diversify into multiple categories of collecting. If you are an investor, don't just invest in one thing, have a varied investment portfolio. Everything right now is getting hit, whether you're in stocks or real estate, or you're in digital collectibles, physical collectibles, everything to some extent has been hit. But over the course of time, what you will tend to find is asset classes um, get hit and grow in various times. This happens to be like one of those more all-encompassing moments. But over time, you know, if you have a varied and diversified base of assets, you tend to win, um, whatever that may look like. Uh, But you tend to have a good outcome. Um, And that's and that's what I always suggest. Jeremy, thanks so much for coming on. It was such a great time. (laughs) We're very excited for this for quite some time. And it was such a pleasure having you on. Yeah, such a great conversation. Listen, guys, I like my pleasure. I'm and. uh, you know, I love the collectible community. I love the fandoms out there, whether it's physical or digital, or whether it's people who are just trying to learn more uh, about the area of, collect- of collecting and, and how maybe they could be a part of it. Um, and uh, you guys are at the forefront and it's, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with you. Thanks, Jeremy. That means so much. And by the way, yeah. I have to say, thank you for all your amazing tweets. They're so mm-hmm. they're so positive and heartwarming and and thought provoking, mm-hmm. and they're great. Yeah. I really enjoy it <laughs> so much. Thank you, Likewise. thank yeah. you. Yeah, I I have a lot of fun with that, and um, you know, it's exciting. It's almost like playing the lottery. You know, you never know what people are going to react to, and uh, like I posted a tweet about wrestling the other day, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was like a Michael Jackson impersonator, who's also a professional wrestler, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> I was surprised to find out that that tweet two days later had over 3 million views and 50,000 likes. Wow. <laughs> you know, I could post another one today of the same thing and I would have, you know, 173 likes. And, uh, but it, I think I'm addicted. I love the lotto <laughs> and, I, and I also like entertaining people. So that's my, that's my side <laughs> project. And I appreciate your mentioning it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally understand the uh, the obsession. I, I didn't even know how to use Twitter a year ago, and now it's like yeah. <laughs> now we've been, been all in. Yeah, they, <laughs> but, you know what? Elon might want to rethink his backing out of the deal. I, I think seriously. Twitter Twitter is a platform that has more potential for varied ways of engaging with consumers than any other platform. You know, TikTok's algorithm is absolutely incredible. But Twitter's search function and and ability to broadcast is really in its infancy of what it could do. So Twitter could be um, massive compared to what Alana is going in at. So, but I think I think he's trying to wiggle out. 
So we'll see what happens there. But anyway. <laughs> <Make a mistake. laughs> Thanks again, Jeremy, for coming My on. Pleasure. We look forward to having you on again, hopefully in the in the future. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah.